What's up, y'all? So today going to work on uh, Elements of Programming Interviews. Uh, let's show you the title. Elements of Programming Interviews in Python. And uh, we're looking for... So I, in my interview, I got a tough... I got, I struggled with an array problem. I struggled with uh, a stack problem and a heap problem. So my plan here is to work on those areas that I uh, need to practice more. So initial plan is to do all the array problems, do all the string problems, because strings and arrays are very common problems to find. Do all the stack and queue problems and <clears throat> do all the heat problems. So that's my initial plan. I, I, I expect that will change. This is the start. For example, I could do, you know, the first five and then, you know, the first one is hard. The fifth one is super, super smooth. Then I might say, okay, I think I've got it and, and move on from arrays. But my initial plan, do all the array problems, do all the string problems, all stack and queue problems, all heat problems. And, um, just going to adapt from there as, as I see how I uh, get better on these problems over time. Okay, so first let's check out Dutch national flag. Okay, so let's read this problem. The quick sort algorithm for sorting arrays proceeds recursively. It selects an element to pivot. Reorders the array to make all the elements less than or equal to the pivot up here first, followed by all the elements greater than the pivot. The two subarrays are then sorted recursively. Implemented naively, quicksort has large runtimes and deep function call stacks on arrays with many duplicates because the subarrays may differ greatly in size. One solution is to, is to reorder the array so that all elements less than the pivot All elements less than the pivot appear first, followed by all elements equal to the pivot, equal to the pivot, followed by elements greater than the pivot. This is known as the Dutch national flag partitioning, because the Dutch national flag consists of three horizontal bands, each in a different color. As an example, assume that black precedes white and white precedes gray. So black, white, gray. Okay. Let's take a look. So black, white, gray, what? Black, white, gray, oh, okay, okay. So here they're, they're jumbled together. The, the gray is with the, with the white. Here we've separated out, we've, we separated the colors to be with their own group. And then we've, we've reordered the colors themselves seems like precede that means come before if gray comes before black and black comes before white What? If black precedes white, then black should be in front of white. Okay. Something's going on with the wording here. So the pivot index is three. What? Dang, I don't understand that one. Zero, one, two, three.
yeah, this isn't the greatest explanation for this problem, so maybe we can find, we can go online and find a better explanation of the problem. Or we could, we could look at the examples. So we have, so this book comes with uh, a judge and they have all the input and output data. So maybe if we look at some input and output, we'll get a better idea. Okay, so we're gonna get an array of integers. So kind of like, so like this, we'll get this array of integers and I guess we're getting a pivot index. Is this the pivot index? Zero, one, two. Or is that the answer that they're looking for? Zero, one, two. So if two is the pivot, they're saying this is a valid partition. It seems like what they're calling is a valid partition. So if we say A3 is, zero is the index, is the pivot, right? So we want all values less than zero to be on the left, all values greater than zero to be on the right. Because zero is the smallest number, all values will be to the right of zero. That's, that's how I'm understanding a partition. So for example, two, zero, one, two. So now, if two is the pivot, then we want all values less than two to the left, all values equal to two, you know, same spot, all values greater than two to the right. And because two is the max, all values are going to be less than on the left-hand side of two. If that's how you define a partition, okay, I understand. Okay, takes an array, so let's, let's avoid the hint come to the hint if we need it. So during a, in an interview, they'll give you the problem like this. Look, maybe they'll give you an example or maybe they want you to ask questions to get the example out of them. And it's up to you to talk through your thoughts and come up with a solution. And if you get stuck, then they'll give you a hint. So we'll avoid that hint until we need it. Write a program that takes an array A and an index I into A. Okay, so i is going to be our pivot. It's going to point to our pivot value. Okay, so we're rearranging the array. I see. So, okay. So they want us to rearrange an array. Kind of like a this is like a, okay, so like they described, it's, it's like a pre-processing step to do quick sort. So the idea would be do Dutch, Dutch partitioning for your array and then perform a quick sort after that. I think that's what's going on here. Okay. And how do we, so let's define, what is Dutch partitioning? Uh, so like that. And, okay, so we have to, so we're doing, we're gonna code this up in OCaml and Python. And so we have a little bit of infrastructure to create for the OCaml. So we're gonna make dir rectang, Rectang, uh, Dutch, Dutch, LS Dutch. I think this is the file, let's check. Whoops, no, it's not what I want. Vim. Okay, yeah, this is, this is what we want. Okay. So we're gonna create, make their Dutch, LS Dutch. Make their move Dutch national flag inside this new folder we've created. 
we're going to copy. So we want to take a look at a, a complete one. So let's do parity. We know this is already working. CD Dutch national flag. Okay, so we got this guy. We need to touch init.py to make this part of the package. So we can, this is to make sure all the imports that we'll be doing work. Um, how can I minimize this? My head is in the way, kind of. Not, not really, but it might. Okay, what else? So we need to copy uh, this OCaml folder, copy recursive OCaml to, and we need to copy PyML example and test. Well, yeah, and copy test to here. Okay, so we've. Okay, so here's all of our files in here now. There we go. And so now we just need to update everything. Okay, so let's move Dutch national flag to test, test.py. It's cat test, test.py. Okay, cool. It's got everything we need in there. Nice. All right. What else? We need to update init.py, I believe. Oh, we need setup.py. We need to copy setup. Yeah, we need this guy. Let's check out this PyML in it. Okay, looks good so far. So our function is going to take a pivot index and an array and return none. Oh, because we're going to modify it in place. Oh, this is a problem because in OCaml, you can't modify things in place. Or, oh, actually there is, we can modify, we can modify uh, an array. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so let's, let's see how we do that. Let's do utop array dot make int and then a make an a array. Okay, so let a equal array dot make. This is a cool part about this about OCaml. I don't remember all the functions, but this this thing just, it tells me what I need to give it. I need to give it an integer, I need to give it an A, and then we're gonna get an A array. So let's do uh, make, 
five zero. Okay, so we got an array of five zeros. So let's say, how do we update the value? Can we sit, can we do a dot zero? Maybe let's, maybe we have to go like this. Oh, there we go. Okay, can we go, here's my question. Can we go like this? A dot zero equal two. Bool is false. Okay, can we set it to two? I'm not sure what that error means. My question is like, it's simple to modify an array in place in Python, but there's some extra, extra steps involved for a camel. My goal is to do all this without internet, but I think at this point I gotta, I gotta search. What? Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, the question is how do we update values in an array in OCaml? We could create, we could do it. So in Python, they're doing it, they're modifying the array in place. Right, because they're returning none. But we could do it where we return a new array, the new partitioned array. We get none. We insert in a unpartitioned array, and we could return a new partitioned array, and then later on we could we could think about how do we do that in place. Let's see. Okay, so now we got some internet. Let's figure out how to modify array or camel. Oh, okay, so here's like the assignment operator. how to do it apparently. So this is like the assignment operator, I guess. Let's make it five or four. Cool. Okay. So we can so now we know how to modify our array. Cool. Nice. Thank you. So.
So this is the input. This is the pivot index. Let's, let's try and understand an example. So pivot index is one. So you want everything less than one to the left, everything greater than one to the right, and nothing's changed yet, okay. Now pivot index is one, everything less than to the left. Oh, okay, we're, we're swapping values, okay. I guess that makes sense. We swap zero and one, and then we're good, okay. Same with entry. So let's work this example just by hand so we can get a better understanding. We've got an array and we've got a pivot index. Let's call this our array. And pivot index is, let's start with three. Pivot index equals three. So we need that value is less than to the left, value is equal to next to, value is greater than to the right. So let's do these swaps to figure out how to get there. Okay, so this becomes um, So I'm trying to think of how we can do this. Swap zero and one, zero, one, and then we're done. So what's the question? Write a program that takes an array and rearranges the elements such that, okay, so we just need to modify the array in place. We're not returning like the number of swaps. Hmm. So I knew just looking at this that zero is the min so I could just move it there, but a computer won't know that. We have to tell it that if that's what we want to do. What else could we do? We 
do. This is actually a little difficult. I'm thinking about maybe merge sort, like like we we take the left hand side, we take the right hand side, um, partition those. Wait, let's think. And then combine the results potentially. I'm thinking about moving moving away from the pivot index to the left and to the right. <coughs> Or you could just scan the whole index. You know, start at the beginning, walk through. So what would that look like? Let's say we have a pointer, you know, we're just gonna walk through the whole array and we'll say, you know, if this value is equal to array, so if val equals pivot we'll do one thing elif val is less than pivot let's do let's do it this way if val is greater than pivot less than pivot then we'll, this one will be our else okay so if it's equal to the pivot we're going to swap, swap I and, huh, which one are we going to swap? I guess we'll keep track of, uh, sibling index, our next sibling index. We'll say it's to the left, swap I and sibling index and then we'll update sibling index by so if we swap 0 and 2 i and si then si should become si minus 1 but what happens if we run into an out of bounds how do we handle the boundary that's a, that's a one question so maybe we'll punt on that question and come back to it swap i and si si minus equals 1 something like that All right, so let's do this. Let's swap two. And this I is here now. Swap I is here. And this is our pivot index. Pivot index. Okay, now I is greater than the pivot index. So now what do we do? We swap, swap I and the pivot index. And then pivot index 
is one one less now. It has moved, so let me keep track of it. Okay, I have here. Nothing happens here. Oh, wait. We'll say, so here's an edge case. We'll say if i does not equal pi, then we'll do this. Because now in this case, i equals pi. So we just want to skip this case. Okay, so now we'll say, okay, so this one is greater than the pivot. Okay, no, this doesn't work. Now we've broken it. What do we do here? A little bit stuck. Let's think. Brain is drawing a blank on this one. Okay. Okay, so this is one idea. Let's let's think about another idea. Let's keep going with these ideas. Um, okay, so what if we had? Let's think about that partitioning idea. So here's our pivot index. So we could say everything to the left and to the right. We're going to take those values and left, right. Let's say so we're going to go through go through each value go through left and right and if it's equal to it we're going to we're going to keep we're going to keep track of an equal index equal index, uh, less than index, uh, greater than index, where's the less than go? So we want to place zero right here. But what if this was one? We want to place this. Um, that's not right. What if it was negative one, just for illustration? Okay, so why do we want to place this? Hmm. 
So less than index, greater than index, equal index, pivot index. So less than index, we're going to place this guy here. Um, we'll say J is where we're currently at in processing. So we'll say put this negative one. Let's close up. Okay, so now we want to place this. So we'll update our less than index. And now where are we going to put zero? We want it in between negative one and zero. Hmm. kind of a hard problem. I think it's good to, you know, only spend a max of 30 to 45 minutes on each of these problems. So let's see how long we spent. 37 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and check out the solution here because you only get a max of 40 minutes to spend on these problems. So the idea will be, you know, let's learn how they did it. Let's re-implement their idea in code. And let's, you know, try and commit that to memory so we can solve similar problems in the future. So, yeah, you don't always get, you don't always get the answer. I mean, data structures and algorithm study is super, super stressful because, you know, you don't get a question like this and then you just feel like, oh my gosh, am I dumb? Uh, how will I ever understand questions like these if I didn't understand it now. And you have to have irrational confidence in yourself that you're going to get there. And when I study, I, I like to pump myself up, give myself a pep talk. You got this, man. Not long before you're going to crush this type of problem. It feels corny doing it, but I believe it helped me in my, you know, I grinded really hard before my Amazon interview, and I think that reduced the time feeling depressed and not studying. You know, I got back up on my feet faster by pumping myself up. So I believe it was very valuable for me. Okay, so let's look at the solution. Think about the partition step. Yeah, okay, so, so we, we tried two ideas. We were just going to walk through the whole whole array, or we were going to partition the left and right side from the pivot point. So it looks like this was the correct step. In an interview, we would we would have gotten this hint, and then we would have known to you know stop working on this idea, and then continue with the partition idea, try and come up with a way for where do we put zero when we've already when we've already placed negative one next to it, so. All right, let's read the solution. Oh, okay, three lists. So, so left, right, and equal. Oh, I see what they're doing, like three empty lists. And then you walk through the array. So their idea, I, I believe, let's see. Let, so this would be greater than, this would be less than, this is going to be equal. Let's grab this guy. And so what are we going to do? We're going to go walk through and our pivot, pivot equals zero. Okay, so we'll walk through all the elements in our array and if it's equal, We'll append it. If it's greater than, append it here. Okay, let's move this guy, I here, now I is two. So greater than, we append it here. 
equal to or down zero greater than greater than oh yeah this is yeah and then you see the answer you're like oh that's so easy <laughs> okay all right so now we can recreate an array with all elements um you know output array out array it was this and we would loop through over the elements in less than, append to out array, loop through the elements in equal to, append to the array, and loop through the elements in greater than and append to the array. And then we've, we've built a successful partition. And the order, so the greater than array doesn't need to be sorted. The less than array doesn't need to be sorted. So what would happen? We would append nothing from less than. We would append 0 and 0. And then we would append 1, 2, 2, 1, 1. And then does that give us a successful partition? Zero, zero, one, two, two, one, one. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yep. And this one, it runs in. So this is O of uh, N time. Time and space space because we have to store all the elements in, in their own lists, time because we touch every element once. Uh, it's two for loops, but they're not, they're not nested. So it's like O of 2n, which is just O of 1. Okay. Yeah, that was, <laughs> you see the answer, you're like, oh man. Okay. So this is the brute force approach where we use the, inner. well, it's not, it's O of n, O of n approach. I think the idea here is we're going to be able to find O of n and O of 1 space, no additional space. Ah, okay, so we're going to decrease space and increase time complexity. Let's see how that happens. Oh, so this one they're gonna, wow. Okay, so this one they are gonna iterate from zero. So something like this. Okay, so we got, all right, well that le at least makes you feel a little better. We, we got the two approaches. The O of N time space was the partitioning one. And now it looks like O of one space is you're walking through each element and processing them. Okay, that's cool. Seek an element smaller than the pivot. Is it going to be multiple passes of the array? Okay, so it's two passes. We're going to move all elements. We're going to walk through the array. Let's do it over here. We're going to walk through the array and our pivot, let's keep track of our pivot. walk through the array and look for elements that are small in it. And when we find an element that's smaller, what are we gonna do? That's the key question here. Oh, excuse me. <sighs> Move it to the subarray of smaller elements. I guess this is everything to the left of the pivot index. So small sub array. Uh, let's 
say it's from zero to the pivot index. Large subarray is from pivot index plus one to the end, I guess. And then I guess we're going to adjust this if we find duplicates of the pivot value. So that means zero to here is the small subarray and here to the end is the large subarray. Okay. So it's saying if we, it's a valuable step to like read the solution and be able to implement the solution just from the explanation, not by looking at the code. So that's why I'm still, I'm not moving on to the code solution yet. Move it to the subarray of smaller elements by an exchange. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is the tough part. I'm not sure how they do this. So let's keep reading. All right, let's read how they do this. break oh we break okay so let's illustrate what's happening here hold on there we go okay so We got, we've gotten, oh, close that, sorry. Oh, no. Oh, don't tell me I did that again. Dang it. All right. So I is starting here. J is starting at one plus I. And let's keep a track of our pivot, which is this guy. What's shocking to me is when you swap I and J, they're not updating I. Interesting. So let's say this is the pivot. Let's say two, well, let's say one is the pivot. All right, let's walk through this and see what happens. Is AJ less than the pivot? No. Less than the pivot? No. Less than the pivot? Yes. Okay. So we found one that's less than the pivot. So we're going to swap a I and J. Okay. And break. And so nothing happens because they're the same. 
and we now we break out of this inner loop and we update i okay and j starts at i plus one is two less than the pivot no is this less than the pivot yes so swap one and zero okay break which means update i oh wow okay cool interesting wow okay let's and this is no longer helpful let's say our pivot is one okay okay so we've we've updated those okay and now are we going to find any more elements less than one no but okay well well now the question is what about for elements that are equal to the pivot what do we do there i guess nothing well i guess this is going to be handled in the the second pass through the array okay so for i okay j starts at i plus one if i j if j is less than the pivot okay so it's going to be no for all of these and we're not going to find an element that's less than the pivot now we're going to go through these none of these is going to be less whoops nope and nope okay so we've gone through the first pass now we're going to go through a second pass okay now it's starting to make sense man this is such a valuable technique to understand someone else's code I looked at this code to start and I was like, I don't know what's going on, but set up an example like this and see how the variables are changing. And this is helping me understand what's going on. So we've done the first pass. We're grouping elements smaller to the left. Now we need to group elements bigger to the right. Okay. Okay, and this time, reversed. Okay, so I guess we're going to start I here. Something like this. Let's see. There's too much going on here. Reversed range ten. So, yeah, starting from the end and moving down. Okay. I starts at the last element, and where does J start? J starts, it's going from 0 to I minus 1. Now I minus one to zero. Okay. So J is gonna go do all these values from, from I minus one to zero. Okay. Just wanna check if AI is less than the pivot break. Okay, it is not. Now for J, Starting at i minus one, if a i, if j is greater than the pivot, we're going to swap i and j. Interesting. Okay. Wow, this is really smart. Okay. Um, j. Is this greater than the pivot? Yes. So swap i and j. And then break. Whoops. Is this less than the pivot? 
Oh, whoops. Okay, so we swapped I and J. And now we break out of the J loop. And we move I down. Ah, okay. And now if I is less than the pivot, it is not. Okay, now J starting from I minus 1. If J is greater than the pivot, it is not. J greater than the pivot? No. J greater than the pivot? Yes. So swap I and J. One, two, and then break out of the J loop, which decrements I. Wow, this is awesome. Okay, so we're going to start a new loop here. If J, if I is less than the pivot, is not. For J and I minus one, if J is greater than the pivot, it is not. So now it's going to go through. Go to the pivot, no. We reach the end. We decrement i. That goes here. And we check if any of these values is i less than the pivot, no. And we check if j is greater than the pivot. Nope. So we're going to keep moving through and not make any more changes. But in the end, we have successfully partitioned our, our, uh, our array. And what is the runtime of this guy? Uh, o of n squared. Yes, because of the nested for loop. And you see we process each element, you know, more than once, so. Okay. There we go. Now it fits in the screen. The additional space complexity is now O1, but the time complexity of O of n squared. I equals n over two, and all the elements before I are greater than I, and all elements of I are less than. Intuitively, this approach has bad time complexity because in the first pass, when searching for each additional element smaller than the pivot, we start from the beginning. However, there is no reason to start from so far back. We can begin from the last location we advance to. We make a single pass and move all the elements less than the pivot to the beginning. In the second pass, we move the larger elements to the end. It is easy to perform each pass in a single iteration, moving out of place elements as soon as they are discovered. So I was trying to do this. In my original code, I was trying to do both of these at the same time. It was just too hard. So the great thing about this book is they go, they do a progression. First, they show us, they show us the O of n, O of n solution. Then they show, show us O of n squared, O of 1. And now they're going to show us O of n, O of 1. So that is really helpful to see how to finally get to the optimal solution. So that's why this book is great, is they show you how to go from the brute force to the optimized. And, and they don't just like skip the steps in between, which, you know, for a beginner or for an advanced person, that's fine. Just skip the steps. But for a beginner, you have to see the steps so that you can go and re you can reproduce that in the similar problem you see. Okay. So we've we've learned how to do O of n, O of n, time and space. Now we've learned how to do O of n squared, O of 1, time and space. And now we're going to learn how to do O of n, O of 1, time and space. This is pretty cool. This book is great. Definitely recommend it.
yeah so huh so like i started off trying to do this solution it was just there was just too many details for me to parse through when i was trying to do it so yeah working progressively up to this it helps you manage all those little details it's good to see i was at least on the right track to start So we're basically using the same code, except always swapping I and J. We're keeping track of this, you know, a, a smaller index and a larger index, and we're we're updating them whenever we swap. And so let's walk through this in code and see what's happening. So Let's, let's keep our pivot index as one. I like that because we get to see what each path is doing. Wait, what? It's funny, I, was, I kind of, you know, I ramped down my leak, code, leak coding for about two weeks since I got an Amazon offer. And I already feel like, like, this all seems foreign to me right now. And so it shows you that you have to keep practicing this thing. It's not a normal way to think. So you have to keep practice, keep working at it because, yeah, right now I feel like this is all a little bit foreign. So I'm going to have to, I'll have to ramp back up to making this, you know, seem, seem easy, seem easy. And you just got to put in the repetitions. I, I view leak coding as like, have you ever watched Stephen Curry pregame? He's doing all these trick shots and, and, you know, he's the best in the game. So that's probably helping his game. Otherwise that he wouldn't be doing it. And in the same way, I think leak coding helps us as software engineers. It's not, it's like kind of a trick shot. It's not exactly what we'll be doing as an engineer, but it makes us better engineers. So that's why it's worth doing. I'm not sure why they would, so we got two O of N, O of one solutions. Why are we doing the second one? And what's going on with this? <laughs> All right, so let's work through an example. Um, I is going to start here, S is here, L is here, and our pivot index is 1, the pivot value is 1.
Is I less than the pivot? Yes. So what we're going to do, we're going to swap I and S. And smaller gets incremented. Okay. Is I less than the pivot? No. I less than the pivot? No. I less than the pivot? Yes. So swap I and smaller. Okay. Increment smaller. Less than the pivot? No. Less than the pivot? No. Less than the pivot? No. Okay. Now we do the second pass. Oh, and, and then this one, we're going to start from the end. Okay. Nice. Is I less than a pivot? No. Less than a pivot? No. Less than a pivot? Wait, what? Oh, we're going to break if it's less than a pivot. Okay. Is it less than a pivot? Is it good in the pivot? Okay, no, no. So we get here, and I is greater than the pivot. So what are we going to do? We're going to swap I and larger. So this is one. This becomes two, and we decrement larger index, and we update I. Okay. Less than a pivot? No. Greater than a pivot? No. Less than a pivot? No. Greater than a pivot? Yes. So swap I and L. This become so we're gonna update I, and then we're gonna decrease. We're gonna not decrease. We're gonna swap two and one. So this becomes one and one becomes two and then we decrement largest lar larger larger okay and we're going through is it we ask ourselves is this less than the pivot yes okay so break and we're done nice wow that is friggin brilliant and and we can do more examples like you know, sometimes it takes me, you know, I have to do three, walk through three or four examples like this before the algorithm just kind of sinks into my head. And I know it can sink into my head by, by performing all these checks, performing all these checks while not, not, not looking at the answer. This is telling you what to do. If I can not look at this and, and, and perform all these actions here, then I know I've internalized the algorithm. Okay, so, um, all right, so we got, we, we got three solutions so far. We got O of N times space. We got O of N squared time O of one space. We got O of N time O of one space. And in an interview, it's important to go from one to the next, because if you just give them the O of N O of one, they'll ask themselves, did, did he just check this code out from EPI, memorize it, and now he's just regurg regurgitating it to me? The interview is going to be like, I want people to solve problems, not someone that's just going to memorize the solution, because that won't help you when you reach an ambiguous problem or something new. But if you can go from brute force to optimize, then the interviewer is confident you could do the same on a new problem too. So that's why it's important. It's not just this one. It's the steps going from this one to this one. Whoops. To this one, the third one, one, two, three. So that's, that's crucial. Okay. So let's think about that. Okay, so let's do let's do all three. Let's do all three, uh, walking through it in code like this. Then we'll write it up in Python and we'll can it. I'm still doing this experiment. I my thought is that you know OCaml, the functional elements, it's gonna there's more abstractions available to you, and it will leave less little bits 
running around in your head, which allows you to focus more of your energy on solving the problem. That's, that's my theory. So I'm testing that by you know, trying to solve some problems with it and seeing how it goes. So we'll, yeah, let's do this, uh, you know, just walking through the example, seeing how, how the data changes. Then we'll implement it in OCaml and Python. Okay, so. Okay, and we'll say pivot equals one. Mm, and we want to do, yeah, okay. Starting the same spot at all three, and we want to work through how to do this. Okay, so we're going to create three arrays, less than, equal, greater than. We're going to walk through the array, and we're going to we're going to put elements uh, where they should go in these three arrays, and then we'll combine them in the end. So zero is less than, one is equal to, two is greater than, less than, greater than, Equal to this is equal to. Okay, so now we have our three arrays. Now we need to combine them. So we'll say out is empty, and we'll loop through. We'll start with less than, uh, equal to, and then greater than, and add append all these elements to out. So we we'll start here. J, we append zero. Append zero. Move to the next one. And now we append one. And we append one. Append one. And now we append two. Append two. Okay, and then we return this. This is what we will return. Okay, cool. So we have an idea of how to do this in old n time and space. Cool. And this would be two for loops. The first for loop is to create these, these three arrays. And then the second for loop is to create the out array. Okay, and how are we going to do over and squared, over and space? This is how you test yourself. Do you know the algorithm? Hmm. How do we do this? I remember the first one. I remember kind of how to do the last one. Now I'm thinking about how do we do the middle one? I'm going to do the last one first and come back and it'll probably help me solve the middle one. Okay. So we're going to have an index. We're going to have a start. So we're going to do two passes for this last algorithm. And we'll say if this is less than the pivot, then we're going to swap I and the smaller index. Okay. So we swap them 
you increment i, increment 1, and okay, now we check. Is this less than the pivot? No. Is this less than the pivot? No. Less than the pivot? Yes. So swap i and s, which becomes 0, which becomes 1. We are moving on to the next i, and we're moving our s forward. Now we're asking, is this less than a pivot? No. Less than a pivot? No. Less than a pivot? No. Okay. And now we've, we've done that. And now we're going to start from the end and look for elements that are greater than the pivot. So we'll ask ourselves, is this greater than the pivot? No. Greater than the pivot? No. Greater than the pivot? Yes. So swap i and l. and decrement L. Okay. Is this greater than the pivot? No. Is this greater than the pivot? Yes. So we swap I and L. Decrement L. Is this greater than the pivot? No. Greater than the pivot? No. Okay, we've reached the end and we we're done. We finished our algorithm. So this is O of n time and O of one space. So now let's think about how do we do it. In <laughs> we know how to do O of n, but not sure how to do O of n, o of n squared. Uh, so O of n squared means there's going to be a nested for loop. Okay, we know that much. We know, I do remember there were two passes also. So we're going left. We're going from beginning to end and end from end to beginning. There's two, two passes and there's a nested for loop. Okay, so I remember there's an i and a j. i here and a j is going to start at i plus 1. And what are we doing here? Oh, we don't have, so we don't have s and l. This is the benefit of, this is the power move for this solution, right, is, is keeping track of uh, the next spot to move our element. And we don't keep track of these things here. So we'll say, okay, so if, so we're going to do two passes here, one going from left to right, and the other from right to left. So for the right, left to right portion, we're going to say, um, is j greater than, what are we going to say? Is j less than the pivot? That's our question. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. So we never check. How do we check zero? <laughs> J is never zero, so we can't check it. So how are we going to check J? Or, yeah. How do we check zero? Huh. Oh, this is where we say, you know, if if i is less than a pivot, break. So just move on to the next one. Well, let's see. Do we have to do that? Is the question. Okay, so we're gonna check, check all the j's, see if we can find anything that's less than our pivot. Less than, no, less than, no, less than, yes. So swap i and j and increment i. Now we're gonna do a new step. So we ask less than pivot, no, less than pivot, yes. Okay, so swap zero, one, and then break, update i. Now we ask less than pivot, less than pivot, less than pivot, less than pivot, no. And we're gonna go, keep doing this for all of these. Less than pivot, less than pivot, less than pivot, no. For all these. Less than, no. Less than, no. Less than, no. Okay, so we've done our first pass. And now we're going to do a second pass. And this time, it's going to be reversed. We're going to start at the end. And we're going to look for elements that are greater than the pivot now. So we'll say, is J greater than the pivot? No. 
J greater than pivot? Yes. So swap I and J. One, two, and decrement I. Okay, start. Next iteration, greater than pivot? No. Greater than pivot? No. Greater than pivot? Yes. Swap I and J. One, Now we ask ourselves, greater than the pivot? Ooh, and I think this is where, it's, it's just an optimization. It doesn't, doesn't change the runtime complexity, but there's like a break. They say if I is greater than, if I is less than, yeah, so we're gonna keep going until we hit the zero. If I is less than the pivot, then we'll just break it's, it's kind of a minor optimization. It doesn't change the overall runtime of the function. Okay, so now we ask, greater than pivot? No, greater than pivot? No, greater than pivot? No, greater than pivot? No. Update there. Then we ask, greater than pivot? No, greater than pivot? No, greater than pivot? No, okay, update. Greater than pivot? No, greater than pivot? No, update. Greater than pivot? No, update. Okay, we're done. Okay, so now we know that we feel okay about these algorithms. We know how data, how the variables are changing as we work through them. So now we can go opt we can go implement each of them in code. So yeah, I'm feeling yeah, it's it's funny how when I first looked at this problem, I was I feel feeling a bit of dread. I was like, oh boy, I don't really know how to do this. And now after walking through these, these examples and seeing how are the variables changing, this, it really, it's, it's feeling a lot better up in here. Okay. So we'll save this scratch for now and then we'll, so do we want to do OCaml first or do we want to do Python first? So our goal here, we're doing an experiment. We want to, we want to see if um, we want to see if using OCaml is going to make maybe st studying these problems a bit easier and. That would be nice if <laughs> this is so tough already, if we can find something that makes it a bit simpler, that would be great. So we're going to start with OCaml. We'll try and implement in OCaml first, and then we'll implement in Python and make sure it passes all the test cases. So going to have to do some maintenance work. We have two inputs here, a pivot index and a list. So. So our evaluate function is going to be, you know, index and an array. Oh, we can't do a, we'll go like that. How about that? And I like to do types. This is going to be an int. This is going to be int array. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. And it's going to return. For now, we're just going to return an int array. Oh, I guess. Well, I guess we could return unit. Unit. Nice. Okay. Okay. So how are we going to do this? So we're going to do, first we're going to do, oh man, that sucks. Okay. Uh, this first one will be, oh then time and space. And then we're going to do, we're going to do three. Is O then squared?
time. Hold one space. And we're going to do O of n time and O of one space. We can move this stuff. Okay, so for this one, we're going to create th three arrays. Hmm. We don't know the size of them, though. How do we get the array length? I guess we could do a list. Mm. We could use three intermediate lists to hold less than values, equal values, and greater than values. List, list processing is super simple in OCaml. It's pretty elegant. Okay, so we'll let So now I'm thinking, so we want to make, I'm going to create three lists, less than, equal to, and greater than. I'm not sure how in OCaml to return multiple values. So I'm going to try and look that up. How do I return multiple values, OCaml? OCaml uh, multiple returns. Multiple return values, yeah. Return types, that's not what I want, but return values, this is what I want. Return a tuple, okay. Oh, sweet. Man, this Rosetta code, this showed me exactly what I needed. Awesome. Thank you, Rosetta code. That's awesome. Okay, so let process in let less than equal greater than equal process Okay, so we can return three, oh man, crap, I hate when that happens. We can return a tuple in this uh, function we're gonna make here, it's gonna be a recursive function, and then we can set three variables equal to the return, like this. Nice. 
That is so super simple. And that was really helpful. Okay. And so the question is, what are we going to give it? We're going to give it... It's going to have... Uh, I guess just call these... A, B, C. And this is going to be greater than, less than, greater than, well, less than, equal, greater than. And it's going to have an X value to know when we've reached uh, the end, to know how much more we need to process. We're gonna have a couple cases if x equals the length of our array. How do we get that? Array dot length. Nice. This is why I love man. This OCaml is really cool. So you just put in this function, and you know you get it takes two arguments: the array and what? Oh, it takes the array and it returns an integer, the length. That is super helpful. I don't have to look up any documentation. Pretty dang nice. If a equals array, and I can do this once. I can say let len equals array dot length of array in. If this equals the len, then we're going to return less than equal to and greater than equal to and greater than and this is a tuple when you do wait what's the problem here okay when you do uh it's telling us that when you do commas that's going to make it a tuple and we don't need the we don't need the parentheses it's unnecessary we could go like this but you know it's not unnecessary and you know part of part of functional programming is like not not using a bunch of unnecessary stuff, basically. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go, x is going to start at zero. Process, we're going to give it this, this, this. Three empty lists to start, and we're going to start at zero. Boom. Okay, cool. So then after that, we're going to have our three lists less than equal to greater than man it's just so beautiful to write in OCaml it's just I really like it a lot else what are we going to do okay This is not going to be recursive.
How, here's my question. They're returning none, so how do they know? How are they test? I guess you can just test. Oh, you can test it after running this function that it equals the expected output. Okay, I see. All right. I was wondering, like, how are they going to test before and after? Okay. What is this? Gotcha. Then, what are we going to do? This is, um, okay, then, Why does it do that? Okay, so this is this is how we're updating the values on each iteration, and now we need to call process again to see this iterative function working. Okay. All right, so we're gonna call process less than equal to and greater than. Process Oh, we needed X plus one. So now we've made our less than, equal to, and greater than lists. And now we need to update the input array.
We're going to update our input. So we've got these three less than, equal to, and greater than arrays, and now we want to update array to match, match those values. Okay, so we're going to have an index. Well, let's call it, I guess we can call it x again. And we're, this is going to be our first check. We're going to do something like this. We're going to have an else. going to return a unit it's going to equal something x is going to be an int I guess, let's think. Take a less than, equal to, and a greater than. Match. Oh, we want list length, I think, yeah. So list.length, and we just give it a list, and it returns us the int. Nice. Man, I love OCaml. It's so nice. List.length equals zero.
There's a good one, sir. What are we going to do when less than is equal to nothing? There's no longer anything there. I'm not sure what to do here. Let's let's uh, fill in the stuff that we do know what to do. So with this one, what are we going to do? We're going to we're going to update the current element in array. I guess we need an x. X. It's going to be an integer that tells us where we're currently at in processing. Our array so in and how are we going to call this we're going to say update lte gt and zero okay so here what are we going to do we're going to say how do you do o camel multi-line function and I'm having trouble thinking about how I want to describe my issue here. The issue is like, how do I do multiple commands on this branch? 
of the pattern matching. Do I just put a colon in between them? I'm not sure. Yeah, this is a similar issue to me. Okay, so to go to a new line, we use one semicolon. Makes sense. Separate expressions that should be evaluated in order. So here's how we do multi-line. So we'll say uh, 
um, what are we going to do? We're going to say set. We're going to say array x. We're going to set it to um, head. And then, gosh, I don't like that that happens. Uh, then we're going to call update. tail equals greater than and x plus 1. Okay. sucks. Why does that happen? <clears throat> I guess just go on to the next one. sucks. Why does that happen? Oh. I only want to start processing the first the equals list when the less than list is has no more elements in it. I'm not really sure what this error means. So it says the pattern matches values of you know a tuple, a three tuple. The pattern matches values of a type three tuple, but a pattern was expected which matches values of type list. What? I don't really understand what's going on there. Um, um I'm wondering. I feel like this case, like we can just assert false. We're never going to reach this case. Mm 
because of this check here. Understand that error. Hmm. Oh, I guess we have to do. understand this error still.
sure what either of these errors mean. This one, expect an expression, okay. Okay, so. I guess maybe I could just append lists. So I think I'm doing a bunch of tough stuff, like processing each one of these. I could just append less than to equal to greater than, and that, that's the final result. So I think I'm making this more difficult than it needs to be. So let's figure out how to do that in Camel. Okay, so list.append. No, what is this soak? A in a pair, list of pairs and returns B. Okay. So we want to look for, yeah, I think I'm just making this more difficult than it needs to be. Append list of camel. I think, yeah, it's going to be much simpler than I thought. Oh, but we're updating the original value. That's why we have to do this tough stuff. Cool. So rather than matching on, wait, what? Oh, okay. So we can match. Lt e g t with. This one's going to be empty. Head, tail, and we don't care about that one. Gosh, that's so annoying. Okay. Wait, what? Empty. Why? There we go.
There we go. That's at least a little nicer. There we go. I think that'll work. Let's see. <clears throat> and I guess it makes sense to put this function. I don't know. Um, I guess like this. seems like the best way to organize the code. So you would start, I guess, reading it from the bottom. You'd see we're going to update using these three values. Where do we get those three values? We get them from process. And the idea is update is going to, if, if everything is empty, just return with no nothing. If less than still has values then let's update the current value of index and, and x is going to go all the way to the end and we can we can do an assertion we could say uh, we could assert uh, assert list that length Less than plus list that length equal to plus list that length greater than equals list that length array. What's the problem here? Oh, okay. What's the problem there? Hmm. It's a little strange. Expecting a period? What? Oh, um, wait, maybe. What? What's going on here? Change some int. What the heck?
so you don't need any parentheses. That's the problem there. <coughs> Syntax error. Assert the camel. How do we do that? Let's see. Is there a function definition? Oh, we have to wrap in parentheses. Let's see. Ah, wait. Okay. Nice. Okay, cool. So we just have to wrap this in parentheses. What's the problem here? There we go. What's wrong with this? Oh, uh, array. Why is this unbound? Does it get used up? That's interesting. So you can't reuse? That's really weird. Huh. That's really strange. Not sure what's going on there. Make this a list. So we need it to be an array to do the array indexing. Because the list is, it's like a linked list. So we don't have the, it would be O of N to find every element if we didn't want to use an array. So we have to use an array. Okay. Um, so we expect this to do what we, what we've been, what we did in uh, here, right? Um, where's O of N squared? Oh, then this one, this one, where we create less than, equal to, and greater than, and then we update the original uh, with these values. Hmm. Yeah. This is what we expect to be doing with this uh, OCaml code. Camel is beautiful, man. It's really nice. So this is O of, let's think. O of, O of len, which is just the, only, the amount of elements in array. And times 
this. <coughs> this one is also Olen. And what space are we using? We're not using any space on this one. We're just consuming it. All in time, all in time, and space. What space are we using? We're not using any space. We're just consuming it. There's no extra space here. All of one space. I don't know why. There's something wrong with my plugin. It like just <laughs> moves everything to the beginning of the. I don't like that. <laughs> that sucks. Okay. So I'm still learning all camels. So I just learned today that you know we can write a multi-line function by just adding one exclamation or one colon, semicolon. And I don't really understand what this is doing. I've just seen that done many times. So I'm just copying. They're like at the end of a function, you do two uh, semicolons. I'm not sure what's happening there. It's it's probably scope. It's saying you know stop stop reading anything. Evaluate scope has, ends at line 33. I think that's what it's, it's saying. I think it's equivalent to like a closing bracket for a function in Java. An unindent in Python. I really love those recursive functions. So it makes it you don't have to incur, you don't have to keep track of like where where is my i value. We just do x plus one. We just continue to do x plus one, and we don't have to think about like well where does it stop? Well, it stops when these things are empty. So it just does it for us. <laughs> it's nice. All right, so let's test this. We can get the i in the in array. Let's say. give it let's give it this guy There we go. Oh, whoops.
This is so weird that it's like just pasting each line. It's like a really fast typer. It's like a typewriter. <laughs> this is weird. That's not what we wanted. Dang it. Ah, oh, oh no. What? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. So our input was seven, and our output is five. What the heck happened there? Um, all right. What the heck? Evaluate. Dang, what? Oh no. <laughs> now how do we debug it? This is how you learn though. You get stuck and then you figure your way out and then you gain some valuable experience. Okay. So I think I want to debug one function at a time to make sure that they're doing what we expect. So let's make sure that the process is working. It's like a fast typewriter. What's the syntax error? Oh, dang it. Oh.
All right. Can use variable GT. That's okay. Probably just compile my code. This is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> Process. Okay, take int list, int list, int. What? Hold on. Hold up, hold up, hold up. It should be three int lists. Int list, int list. GT is an int list, dude. What? Ah, crap. What? So this is the correct function, signature, three in list, an int, and an int array. And this is, oh, okay, oh, I missed the first one. One, two, three, int, int array. Okay, cool, nice. Um, A, what the heck? Okay. Oh, nice. Boom. There we go. Okay. So we know that process is working. Process pulled out all the values less than, all the values equal, and all the values greater than. Nice. So we confirmed that one. Cool. Okay. Now it looks like maybe we have some issue with, with this guy. Oh, crap. Okay, so trying to test out this update function. We've confirmed that process is working, correct? It's breaking up, we give it an input array and it breaks it up into less than equals and greater than lists. And now we need to update the original array with those, with those lists we created. Okay, so we need to test this update function. And just to remind ourselves, let's add types to this thing so we know what, what, what is the input, what is the output. This is an int list. Int list. List 
and this is an int. And this is keeping track of the index into the array that we're updating. I'm not sure what I like better. In Haskell, you can say, in Haskell, you do to do the type signature, you do something like this. And you'll go int list, int list, int list, int, and then unit. So, and then you can pull all these types out of this signature down here. I'm not sure what I like better. This is, the OCaml way is one less line of code, but then it's like a lot longer. I'm not sure. What we could do though, if we wanted to just, we could do it like that. We, we could go, um, we could just make it a comment. We could do it the OCaml way or the Haskell way. So we can go int list, int list, int list, int, and this returns a unit, which is just void in Java, none in Python. I like this. The type checker is still going to check that the inputs are all matching. They're all the right types. And we get to have this, you know, separating out the types from, from the, uh, from the parameters. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to yeah try this out. Keep doing this for until, yeah, just give it a shot. I like separating them because if I'm thinking to myself, what is coming in, what is coming out? I can just look at the, the type signature. If I'm wondering about like what variables does this function have, I can just look at this and it's not all commingled and so I don't have to like pull it out individually. Elm also has this type of list like type signature. Let's test this function. Let's add the type signature to this guy too. This, the stars in between these values mean this is a, a three tuple. Like this.
rather than trying to just copy and paste everything into the REPL, I'm just going to run the file, you know, compile and run the file. At this point, it's a little bit easier. Okay, so print array or camel. So the idea is we're going to print the array before and print the array after. And we hope to see after, this is what we hope to see. Um, this guy. So our evaluate function takes an index. Okay, so let's try this. And what's wrong with this? All right, so let's just compile this and see what error we get, and then we can debug from there. Um, let's run this.
So we get the syntax error. No error there. Let's try that. What? So part of learning a new language is understanding what all the common errors mean. I remember in Python, I would get just a random, you know, name error, all these errors I didn't understand to start. And just after seeing them many times, I started to get a pattern, develop a pattern recognition for what does it mean for certain errors. There we go. So that works. Wait, so why didn't... Oh, because I have to do something like this. There we go. Okay, cool. So we got it to run. That's good. And we also want to print... Print end line. Print new line. So maybe we can just try this print new line. There we go. Okay. Nice. So we know it's working now. This is our input array. We use one as the pivot. 
and so we want everything less than to the left everything equal to right next to it and greater than to the right so we got it to work so that's good news good job y'all we got it <laughs> okay cool all right so this is oh let's let's uh let's figure out how much space we're using here space and time so this is going to go o of len time and space this first process function and update is going to be o of len time o of len space God, I love pattern matching. It just makes it so simple. I love pattern matching. Okay. So normally in a functional language, we're not programming with side effects, but this function does have a side effect. We input this array. The input is this guy. Then we run this function. And now we've, you know, we've changed array because it looks pretty different afterwards. So sometimes there's side effects. That's functional programming is no side effects, but sometimes there are. We could we could make this a no side effects function by just returning uh, an int array, a new array. But we're not doing that for this function. Okay. O of n time and space. Now let's do O of n squared, time and space. And so let's remember how we did that. Okay, so we have we have i and j. We're going to search for, we're going to check and see if we're going to iterate through the array and if j is ever what are we doing? If J is, oh, we're doing two passes. One pass is going to look for elements that are less than the pivot. The other one's going to look for elements that are greater than the pivot. So let's remind ourselves of what's happening here. So our pivot is one. Um, crap, where's the input? There we go. Okay, so the pivot is one, this guy. So we ask ourselves, is, is j less than one? No. j less than one? No. j less than one? Yes. Okay, so swap i and j. And they're the same value, so nothing happens. And then increment i. Go back here. Is j less than one? No. j less than one? Yes. Swap i and j. Zero. One. Increment i. Okay. Now we ask ourselves, j less than pivot? No. 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 j less than pivot? No. 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 j less than pivot? Less than pivot? No. Less than pivot? No. Okay. So that's our first pass. And then our second pass is going to be the opposite direction. We're going to start i at the end. And we're going to start j one less than i instead of one more than. So now our now the question we're asking is, is j greater than our pivot? j greater than, greater than the pivot? No. Greater than the pivot? Yes. So swap, swap these two values. Okay. And decrement i. And now we start again. Less than pivot. Or we're looking for greater than pivot. Greater than pivot? Greater than pivot? Yes, greater than pivot. So swap i and j. Two. Ah, two. One. Decrement i. Start over with j. I. Okay. Greater than pivot, greater than pivot, greater than pivot, greater than pivot. No. Decrement i. Start over with j. Good and pivot, good and pivot, good and pivot. No. Start over J. Good and pivot, good and pivot. No. And so, good and pivot. No. Okay. So there we go. 
and we get the desired result. So this is going to be O of n squared time because we have we're going to have a um, for each element in our array we're going to touch n minus one n minus some number elements in the array. So it's it's a nested for loop, and that's going to be O of n squared time. So how can we do this? How can we do this with recursion? This is the question I'm thinking about now. Okay. What was that? Okay. So So we're going to do two passes. We're going to have a let, um, you know, less than, less than pass. We're looking for elements less than the pivot. So let's copy a little bit of code here. We're going to copy these guys. We're going to have a recursive function two recursive functions, let less than and let greater than we have i and j, both of them i and j okay We're going to do a less than pass and we're going to do a greater than pass. Um, so let's describe in English what's happening on the less than pass. We're going to say, um, we're going to iterate through the elements of array starting at i plus j j starting at i plus one and if we find that the current element is less than the pivot we're going to swap i and j and we're going to keep going until we hit the end with j then we'll increment i and we'll keep going with i until we hit the end with i okay so i i know how to write that in a for loop I'm not sure how to do that in a recursive function. Let's think. So 
So this is also going to return. There's no, going to be no return here. Let's do, I like this, this style. So it's going to be less than, takes an int, int, we're going to return a unit. Okay. If J I'm thinking about like what are the ending conditions. So here, i equals you know len minus one, and then i equals here. Then we want to stop. I guess we don't want to stop here because we have to check this case. But we do want to stop when we get to len minus one. And j, we're stopping j when j is len minus one. j is len minus one, then we want to we want to recursively call the function in increment i. So for example, say we get here, j is equal to len minus one. So let's increment i, and let's do i plus two. We want to be one more than what's the problem here? All oh, right, this is going to be recursive. Recursive. Else. Okay, so j does not equal len minus one. So what we're going to do, we'll say, oh man, so many if and else statements. Okay, if array j is less than p, then Plus 
Wap. Swap I and J. And call less than I J plus one. Gosh, I I really hate that. I'm gonna have to dig into my Vim config and figure out why is this happening. Why does it always shoot it to the beginning? It's not what I want. Okay, so we have to make this function swap. Let temp equal array i. Oh my gosh, that sucks. Let's set array dot i to array dot j. And let's set J to temp. Why does it say this is unused? Oh, we have to give this an in. There we go. What's wrong with this?
So, one thing I don't like about this is we're you know, three levels deep in this if else statement, so that's not ideal. You can also write this like this. So we want to check. Okay, so we still have to do this check. When j is len minus one, then we still have to say, is j less than the pivot or j greater than the pivot? So we want to stop when j goes to len. Okay, so otherwise i is not, so this else statement, i is not, the last element and j is not um, outside of the is not equal to len. That's what's happening here. Okay, so this is a little bit nicer because it's less of an indent. It's not three levels of indent, it's two. Okay, so let's think. I'm not sure what the problem is with this. Let's learn. Oh, camel, if else. Maybe we're doing something wrong. Not sure what that issue is here.
multi line if else OCaml. Okay, this is the problem I'm having. Yes, how do I do this? So I guess I can try this begin end thing. I'm always interested when I find someone that you know, knows a lot about OCaml. I would love to work on it, but it's not a common language in, in industry. You know, Python, Java, and C++ dominate there. OCaml is, you know, unfortunately just mostly an ac academic language, or if you work at Jane Street. Oh, maybe, I wonder if he uses OCaml at Chegg. Okay. So let's try this end, begin, begin end thing. Then begin. And else. Okay, so that seems to work. that a little better.
Cool. Okay. I wonder why. Oh, okay. So they're using, they're using in instead of a, uh, what would happen if I go like this? Does that work? No. Oh, okay. Okay, so looks like that will compile. So that's nice. And so let's think about what lesson is doing. So we think we've got it. So let's let's walk through this example. Okay, so the first case, if i is ever here, then we just want to return. We're done. Okay, next case. No, i is down here and j is len minus one. Okay, good. We're still going to do that comparison. But if j is here, then we're going to call, we're going to increment i. And we're going to set j to i plus 2, right? And i previously was here, so i plus 2 is going to be 1, 2. OK, cool. Seems like that works. Now, if we find an element that's less than our pivot, we're going to swap i and j. And we're going to call, we're going to call less than by incrementing j with, with a j increment. OK, so. And so how can we see, the question is, how can we see that this is O of n squared? It's really easy to see in imperative language because you just see the, the nested for loop. And so you've, you've developed that pattern recognition. A nested for loop is O of n squared. But how do we see that this is O of n squared? Well, we see that, you know, we're going to, we're going to, and I guess we just walk through an example and we see that this is, this is the, where we're going to start. We're going to do this one and we're going to increment j until it gets to len. And then once j is len, we're going to increment i. And we're going to bring j back here. And we're going to increment j until it gets here. And we increment i. So, so I guess just walking through the code, we see that this is going to be O of n squared. And maybe... Maybe this is the start of our pattern recognition to recognize open squared in a recursive function. Okay, so now we want to make greater than. So for this guy, i is going to start at the end. j is going to be 1 minus i. So I is starting at len minus 1, j is starting at len minus 2, If i equals zero, then return. Else if j equals negative one, greater than one okay so this makes me think I have to have to go like this I 
minus one and j will be i minus two. Else, greater than p, then begin and swap i and j and call greater than with i and j minus one. I'm wondering, can I do this? Can I go like this? A little bit less code. Let's do that here. I like this a little better because it's, it's a bit less code and still clear, like the intent is what's happening is still clear. Okay.
Okay. What's wrong with this? So evaluate's gonna do the two pass. I wonder why this doesn't want the in from us. Okay. So we're calling less than, we're starting at the beginning. We're calling greater than, we're starting at the end. And hopefully that gives us the desired result. So let's think about what's happening here. So when we do less than, we're starting at zero and one. And we're checking, is j less than p? No, no, yes. And then we're gonna swap them. And we're gonna increment j. Less than, less than, less than, okay. So we got that. And we can see that it's over and squared by you know just walking through the data. Okay, and we're checking greater than. Now we're starting at the end, the last element, and the second to last element. And we're asking, is j greater than our pivot? No. Yes. Okay, then swap them. Swap them and, oh, we missed something. This is, this is why it's good to run through an example. So if we swap, then we want to we wanna go like this. I minus 1, I minus 2. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's what we want. Because we don't want to swap the same. So we find a second j that's that's greater than our pivot. We don't want to swap it with something that's already. We don't want to swap it in an index that al has already been swapped. That's why. Okay. So cool. We just caught an error there. So we want to do i. Um, so when we swap, we want to do i plus one. and i plus 2. Okay. Let's check that out. So we get to here. j is greater than the pivot point. So we're going to swap them. We're going to decrement i, and we're going to set j to 1 less than the new i. Yeah i equals i minus 1, j equals i minus 2, right? So i is here. Next step, uh, next iteration, i will equal i minus 1, j will equal i minus 2. Cool. Okay, so great example of finding an error by just walking through an example. Okay. Hmm, okay. So we expect the same result with this guy. So let's run this and see what happens. Oh, actually, it might be different, but wait. So this is not correct. Dang it. Because we want zero to be down here. So we did something wrong. 
Let's figure out what. So what do we want this to be? Let's let's check. Scratch. Okay, so let's figure out what we want this to be. Okay, so we're checking is j greater than. We're doing the less than pass, we're gonna do the greater than pass. Is this less than the pivot? No, no, yes. So swap i and j, increment i, reset j. We're asking again, is this less than pivot? No, yes, swap i and j. Increment i and reset j. Is this less than pivot? No. And for all of these, we're not gonna find any more zeros. Okay, so this is the less than pass. Now we're gonna do the greater than pass. So we set i at last and second to last. And we're, now we're asking, is j greater than the pivot? Greater? No. Greater? Yes. Okay, so swap. And then reset i and reset j. We're asking, is j greater than the pivot? No. No. Yes. Okay, swap. Reset i and j. Okay, so that's what we should get. Yeah, so what happened there? This one is incorrect. And this one and two are incorrect. We need to swap one and zero. We need to stop this, swap this two and this one. How did that happen? Let's walk through this example um, with the code. That's how we're going to find out. Okay. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so let's run through less than. Less than starts off at zero, one. And which situation are we in? We hit the else statement. So we'll say, we're asking ourselves, is J less than P? No. Oh. Oh, we do need, we do need an else. Oh, we do need an else. Because every time, Every time we're going like this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, again. And.
Yeah. Huh. We definitely need the else there. Another else. So we're going to need that down here too. Ah, dude, that really sucks. Let's check that. There we go, guys. Okay. So we're missing this extra else statement. And, okay, so let's think about the runtime of these guys. And for now, you know, we just have to kind of walk through and see that you know i start i and j starting here where j is going to touch all n minus one elements and or len minus one elements and j is going to touch n minus two and yeah so for now we haven't developed i haven't developed the product the pattern recognition to recognize something there's a trick in python or java or c plus plus for loop uh a and not, it's not for every case, but for most of the cases, if there's a nested for loop, it's n squared. You still have to think because, you know, the nested for loop, it might only have a constant number of iterations. Like if it's only, if there's the first for loop iterates, you know, it, it grows with the input size, but the second one does not grow, then that is not an n squared runtime. So you still have to check whether the, uh, the number of iterations are growing with the input size. Okay, I think, yeah, I think we're done here. So we've done O of n squared. Now we got to do O of n, um, O of one. And so how are we doing this? We're doing one loop through and we're keeping track. We're doing, we're doing two passes, but it's only going to be one for loop, not nested for loop. And we're, I'm curious to see what that ends up being for our recursive function. Okay, so let's remind ourselves of how we're doing this one. Okay, so for the first pass, we're saying if if i is less than our pivot, then then swap s and i uh, in increment s okay less than pivot less than pivot less than pivot yes so swap s and i increment s less than less than less than less than no okay and for this one now we're asking, now we're going to do the greater than pass. So we're going to start from the end and go down looking for greater than. So, okay, so now we're figuring out, we're asking, is I greater than the pivot? Greater than, greater than, greater than? Yes. Okay, so swap. And decrement L, largest, larger. And now we're asking, is it good in the pivot? Good in the pivot? Good in the pivot? Yes. So swap I and L. Decrement L. This is for smaller, bigger. That's what those stand for. 
and we're going to keep going asking greater than pivot greater than pivot nope okay now we're done so this is o of n time we're going to do two passes two o of n passes okay So it's going to be similar. Let's see. So we're still going to be swapping. We're just going to do for less than we're going to have instead of J, we're going to have S and for greater than instead of J, we're going to have L for larger and smaller. Okay, so let's remember what's going on here. You know, S starts at zero, L starts at len minus one. Okay. Okay, so let's figure out what we need to change here. If we get to n minus 1, then just return. So here's, here's an example I'm curious about. Um, what if this is three? What if our pivot is three? Pivot is three. Wait. I and S start at zero. Okay, so let's let's do this so we can think about what's happening here. So we're asking, is I less than a pivot? Yes. So swap S and I. Increment S, increment I. Is it less than a pivot? No. Less than a pivot? Yes. So swap. Increment S, increment I. Is it less than a pivot? Yes, swap. Increment S, increment I. Is it less than a pivot? Yes. Two, three, increment S, increment I. Is it less than a pivot? Yes, swap. One, three. here and now we're asking is it less than a pivot yes swap increment s increment i so i guess What? 
So now we're checking if i is equal to len. We don't need to check s. Greater than Okay, whoops, nope, swap. Okay, so now let's do, okay, so we swap three and one. So now let's do the greater than pass. So L starts at, okay, so less, less than is going to start, I and S are going to start at zero. Greater than I and L are going to start at both len minus one. Okay. And so what are we doing here? Now we're asking, is I less than the pivot or greater than the pivot? Is I greater than the pivot? Greater than the pivot? No, 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 no. And so it returns this guy. Okay. And let's do, let's do this example now. Less than the pivot, yes, swap and increment both. Okay, less than the pivot, no, no, yes, swap. Increment S and increment I. Is that right? Definitely increment S. Yeah. Yeah, increment I too. Less than pivot, less than pivot, less than pivot. No, okay. So now we're doing L. We're asking is I greater than the pivot? No, no, yes, swap. One, two, decrement L. And Decrement I. We're asking less than the pivot, less than the pivot, yes. So swap. One, two, decrement L. We're asking, or decrement this guy. Asking less than the pivot, less than the pivot, okay. Okay. And we're decrementing a greater than. We're saying, okay, so if we swap 
search for plus or go like that. There we go. Same thing. Okay, so if we swap, then we're decrementing I and L. If we do not swap, we just decrement I. Okay. And let's let's see if we can get a better sense for why why is this one O of N and then this one is O of N squared. Let's see. So this one is O of N squared. This one is O of N. We see here where we're checking these both of these variables i and j, and here we're just checking if i is equal to len. So I think that's the tell, that's the sign, you know? Are we checking one or two? So here it looks like we're just checking the i. Yeah. Here's the question though. Do we need some kind of a check for L? Is there ever a case where, you know, S, S goes all the way out here? or L goes all the way down here, right? When would that happen? So we already looked at the example of three where we have the max value. We can only swap N minus one elements where N is the length of the array. And so we can only increment s by n minus 1 and we can only decrement l by n minus 1 so it will never go outside of the array so that's why we don't have to do a check for l and s cool because we're only doing n minus 1 comparisons for both functions cool cool all right let's try this out so this is what we expect to get zero zero one 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 two two save it Compile and run. Whoa. Index out of bounds. Oh, so we. <laughs> All right, so maybe we did get an index out of bounds. Oh, because we checked. We did the wrong check, I think. Hold on. If i equals negative 1 when we're going down. Well, yeah. There we go, you guys. All right. Cool. Okay. So we got our O of N solution. We got our O of O of N, O of N, time and space, O of N, O of 1, time and space, O of N squared, O of 1, time and space. Cool. And we've done it with recursive functions. So that's that's really cool. OCaml programming is pretty fun. Cool. All right, you guys. So that's that was a study session in Elements of Programming Interview Study Session. That's a great book to help you prepare for big tech interviews. It asks you tough questions like the ones you'll see in the interviews. So if you go on Leak Code, there's leak code, there's easies, mediums, and hards. All of the interview questions I got were medium. There was not a single easy. So you need to be prepared for e mediums and also a hard. I did receive a hard question. So elements of programming interviews, it it is the correct difficulty to study. And it has great explanations. So if you don't understand, you're still able to learn. So, you know, here... This one, for example, I did not understand at first, so I just had to read the solution. Uh, and that's okay, because there's leak code has about 2,000 problems. So I can take what I've learned here and apply this to the next problem that I'm studying. So 
Uh, thanks for watching and stay tuned on the next one, you guys.